the affirmative task we have now is to create a new world order. Notice the new world order. It's almost complete. But I'll myself that we needed a new world order. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order in the third encyclical of his pontificate. Globalized economy. The document was released just hours before the G8 summit. The power behind the scenes secret societies. Notice what is Skull and Bones, Illuminati, Masons and all them groups. They have one master. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. I'm also going to start with the mark of the beast that they already have in White House. So be more patient and all they have to do is enforcing their law and the whole thing is combined with religion. Unfortunate friends, if you don't understand their final goal, you're gonna be doomed. But the good news is, if you know their final goal, you can escape what's about to happen. Some people will show you some of the secret societies, but unfortunately, they don't tell you the power behind the scene and the whole world afraid because they don't know what to do. Today, you're gonna find a watch the whole video. At the Vatican today, a warm greeting for President Obama from Pope Benedict the 16th. It's a great honor for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your greeting. New world order is emerging. When really a new world order can be created, it's a great opportunity. You and all who wear America's uniform remain the cornerstone of our national defense. The anchor of global security. We have to shape an international order that can meet the challenges of our generation. The international order we seek is one that can resolve the challenges of our times. A new world order is emerging. Gordon Brown's verdict as he closes the G20 summit. From America to Ethiopia, they all signed up to a trillion dollar boost for world trade. We'll have reaction around the world and ask what it means for Britain also tonight. the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order it is a new world order with significantly different there have been extraordinary scenes in berlin tonight as thousands of people gathered to hear barack obama deliver key foreign policy speech on his current european tour Democratic presidential hopeful laid out his vision for America's place in a new world order, saying he was speaking as a proud citizen. Pope Francis is a first in many ways, the first Jesuit pope, the first pope from the new world, and the first one to take the name Francis. As Jorge Mario Bergoglio, he lived in a simple apartment. As Argentina's top church official, he opposed Argentina becoming the first Latin American country to legalize gay marriage. He opposed euthanasia and giving away free birth control. Many thought his age of 76 would rule him out this time. He is now the leader of more than one billion Catholics around the world. And as the world found out the name and identity of the new pope, there were cheers. Wake up the whole world, now is a high time to awake out of sleep. Friends, I'm gonna give you a little history. Constantine was the one that who united the church and stayed together, notice, during dark ages. 
pagan Rome. When he marched them to Tiber River, they said they was baptized. So when they came to the church, they was idol statue worshippers. So when they brought their statues in Roman Catholic Church, they start naming them Christian name, Jupiter, and all this thing. They call them Peter and Rosary and all this paganism that they brought to Roman Catholic Church. And some of the Christians they don't like, so they protest against. That's why they call them Protestants or Protestant. So they set up their Jesuit order during 1500. The reason they said their Jesuit order is to destroy the Christians that they protest against their paganism. I'm tired of people saying Christianity is a crutch. It's not a crutch, it's a cross. This planet is covered in blood as a consequence of people who stood for righteousness and truth. They also infiltrate the state to control the whole world. The Jesuit, they created Masons, and now they got Skull and Bones, Illuminati, all them secret societies, friends. And what is Obama and all them power, they all belong to secret societies. I love everybody, I don't have a choice if I want to go to heaven, but I got to tell you the truth. You're right, we must move as quickly as possible to a one world government a one-world religion under a one-world leader. So as he began to travel the world, over 100 trips in his 25 years, the world was watching. His first trip to a conference in Mexico in 1979 instantly transformed the world's idea of the papacy. Some five million jubilant people in one crowd, it was said to be the largest ever. Among those surprised, was John Paul himself. The whole thing is tied with Bible. The church and state is going to unite in the last days and they will bring the mark of the beast that the Bible says. So notice. I did, your own country. Yes. And it was uh, successful. Successful? We have some decisions. It's not so easy, Mr. Paul. The Iraq war has been another foreign policy challenge, beginning with John Paul's papacy. Other foreign policy priorities for Benedict include pushing for peace in the Holy Land and decrying rising secularism in Europe. It's also been quietly working to establish relations, something that was not possible during the last papacy, largely because of John Paul's role in the fall of communism in Poland. The Chinese obviously didn't want John Paul II running around China doing the same thing. Uh, Pope Benedict is, is not that kind of a threat to China. So. Most of the time, in places around the world, Vatican diplomats work outside the spotlight, where experts say they often have an advantage. Some question how much government leaders of today truly listen to what the Pope has to say. And that, observers say, is a moral authority that can't be measured by economic strength or military divisions. A moral authority Benedict hopes to draw upon when meeting with U.S. officials and speaking before the United Nations. I'm Kim Lawton in Washington. The Jesuit order, they also infiltrate every religion, especially Sunday churches. That's why Revelation chapter 17 called this power, whore, notice, the mother of harlot. Jesus Christ is the one who died for the whole world and he's drawn everybody to himself. But this power, they don't want you to go to Jesus Christ. They want you to go to them and confess your sin to them. So notice what Revelation chapter 18 says, and they also infiltrate the king's president. So notice, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen and is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the whole of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornications. And notice, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will to the, the United States. And will to the, the President of the United States.
So on occasion it comes up that uh, that I was the mentor of uh, our president. It's only on occasion we get to interact with him. Well, an, an occasion is fine, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> best of my ability. I will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. The, um, the Obama administration is all in, in their, uh, in their nonstop effort to retain the power, to retain the power to send U.S. citizens to military prisons. And why do you think it is that the Obama administration is so adamant about keeping this controversial provision in place? I really, uh, I, I really uh, can't speak to the motivation. All I can say is that on civil liberties issues, this president has been even more aggressive in eroding American civil liberties than uh, George W. Bush. And it's really an, an unfortunate turn in our democracy. This has been occurring uh, since 9-11, but the Obama administration has gone full in for uh, drones. He's, they've gone full in for targeted assassinations, including of American citizens. They've gone full in for warrantless wiretapping. And now they've gone full in for the right to detain American citizens in military prisons, thus circumventing our democracy and our judicial system. Uh, why the president is doing this when he ought to know better as a constitutional law professor. The Obama administration is openly escalating its campaign against private gun ownership and shaking up the top ranks of the military command structure. But is it also preparing to make war on the American population? According to a person identified as a former senior military official, the answer to that shocking question is yes. You can't have a police state in an armed population, so there's no doubt they're going to take the guns away. A federal judge in the U.S. has ruled Washington cannot indefinitely detain Americans suspected of having terrorist ties unless they have been found in connection with the September 11th attacks. It comes just six months after President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which would have allowed American citizens to be held without trial or charge. The judge initially ruled the act was unconstitutional last month, but the Obama administration asked her to reconsider the ruling. The arrogance of Barack Hussein Obama is growing by leaps and bounds every day. So is his disrespect for the Constitution of our country, for the Constitution of the United States. In fact, when President Obama was a senator, he voted to reinstate the Patriot Act in 2006. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, the Patriot Act threatens our first, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, and fourteenth amendment. We're here at Blessed Sacrament Parish, we are Change LA, to meet someone who has been nicknamed the Black Pope. He's actually the Jesuit general, and uh, his name is Very Reverend Adolfo Nicholas S.J. <laughs> We're here to say hi and talk to him about his nickname and uh, his uh, extreme oath of the judgment. You just came out of a campaign, election, and the inauguration of a new president. We have been exposed to one year and a, and a half of words and words and words or even religious words, because also religious words have been manipulated. I am so happy we have a, a financial crisis. Hello, I really, really enjoyed your service. Thank you so much. Well, I was wondering, much. I had a couple of questions. I was wondering if you could clear something up for me. Maybe later, because uh, oh, now just people real, are waiting. Just really quick, why do they call you the Black Pope? Oh, that's... Uh, they started in the 19th century. Did it really? Yeah, but I don't like it because no. it's in terms of power. No, no? Yeah. Because they thought that the general of the Jesuits had a lot of power, but he, he wears black, so black folk. Oh, maybe, well, the, yeah. I'm not folk, and, and I have, have no a power. And, and I see that there's a lot of liberal symbols here. 
um, one of the things in your in your Jesuit high oath, I think it is, it says something about, furthermore, you promise to declare that we'll, at the first opportunity, um, seek war at any opportunity against heretics, Protestants, liberals. What is that? See here? And that, that, uh, will spare neither age nor sex nor condition and I will hang, mean? waste, boil, flays. You've never seen that. this before? No, I've never seen it. Strangle, bury alive oh and it's horrible. It's and I was like, it's look, it's, it's, it's in the congressional record. But he was very confused. He didn't, he'd never seen it before. I told him it was in the congressional record. He, he said that he might talk to me later about it, but there, there's a big line, so do we want to wait and talk to him later about it? Uh, just so that you know what I was asking him. I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, to make wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition and that I will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to uh, annihilate forever the ex exorable race and then it goes on to say some other s stuff but you can look this up it's on the internet I, I just want to read this on camera real quick and just trying to find a private moment he okay, said that I could talk to him afterwards okay when the line was not uh, too busy you need to go outside with all that okay because right now he's not going to read nothing because he's going to go somewhere else oh Excuse so me. thank you yeah. do you think we were bothering you I think so with your living. Okay. okay. We can't have that. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry. It's just trying to clear something up. I know. But this Well, it's a bill that has received very little attention but may make free speech a felony and seriously restrict your right to political protest just signed into law by the president HR 347 gives federal agents sweeping powers to arrest and bring felony charges against citizens engaged in protests where the Secret Service is present joining us now with more Fox News senior judicial analyst good friend judge Andrew Napolitano judge the thing that strikes out jumps out off the page felony yeah, felony means more than a year in jail. This is not like a traffic ticket for standing and protesting. The type of thing that for 230 years Americans took for granted because it was protected by the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech has actually been abridged. But legislation the president signed last Thursday, supported overwhelmingly by both parties, with very, very little public debate and very little debate in Congress, basically allows Secret Service agents to decide side where there are no free speech zones not speech zones no free speech zones and anybody by the secret service can protected by the secret service can ask those agents to ban protests wherever they are so i can think of three violations speech violations association violations the right to petition the government for a redress of your grievances what good is free speech if the people in the government are so far away from you that they can't hear you judge what about keeping our elected officials safe keeping our elected officials safe is entirely different from insulating them from protest the fact that the president is going to a hotel up the block should not bar you from standing across the street with a sign or with a bullhorn saying what you think about the president's policies that is not a threat to him and it is a part of American history since day one that we have the right to speak freely to about and against those in the government. Mm -hmm. Judge, do you think this is going to be one of those laws that um, is on the books but not enforced? I think it's one of those laws that's going to be enforced when the government wants it enforced. The problem, Eric, is it is puts a lot of um, unbridled discretion in the hands of Secret Service agents who may very well say, you know what, boss, you've had a rough day. We'll keep everybody away from you. Or, you know what, boss, this crowd likes you, so we're going to let, them, uh, we're going to let you hear them. That's 
uh, suppressing speech on the basis of its content, and that has been expressly prohibited by the First Amendment since day one. What, what dictates the Secret Service is present? In other words, aren't they present all over Washington, D.C.? Well, they are, and that's a great question, because this law also allows the president to give Secret Service protection to whoever he wants. I'll give you a bizarre example. His campaign managers are coming to Washington to confer with him about the campaign. He can give them Secret Service protection. And then the Secret Service can say to the kids in the streets, you can't shout at David Axelrod, because the, the campaign manager, because the Secret Service is protecting him. This, this is a slow, creeping destruction of some of our basic liberties, and the president signed it in secret. And now some of the Secret Service are going to be... be uh providing services for the candidates now as well right? correct so correct people aren't going to be able to have their opinion about the candidates if now? the secret service so declares you won't be able to shout at the bible says the mark of the beast means this power has a mark the beast is a language that god is using for this power and they themselves they says in their own book the book of catechism the old version notice they says sunday worship is the mark of authority the new version they don't use the word authority but at least thank god they still admit it even the new version of catechism they still says they changed the sabbath from saturday to Sunday. Friends, the mark of the bees is not worldly speculations that sometimes you hear. Some people say, well, it's computer chip. Unfortunately, you don't find in the Bible. And some people say, you know, it's 666. But according to Revelation 13 verse 18, actually 666 help you to find the beast. What I mean is to identify the beast. But the Bible says the mark, the reason why I repeat and I kind of stretch it because I don't want you to miss it. It's a deception. Notice the mark of the beast. It's clear. Daniel chapter 7 verse 17 says, The four beasts which thou saw are the four kings who reign on the earth. Babylon is the first kingdom. medo persia Empire was the second kingdom. And Greece third kingdom Rome fourth kingdom so when Revelation 13 verse 18 says here is wisdom let him who have understand calculate the number of the beast is a number of a man his number is 666 so according to Revelation 13 verse 18 666 help you to identify the beast. Roman Catholic, Roman numerals, some of them have a value, some of them doesn't. But when you put all of them together, it ends up to 666. Constant to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, but unfortunately, Sunday churches they adopt sun worship day for so many years they don't want to get rid of it. But actually, it's a pagan sun worship day, Sunday worship. Look, even the spellings you'll find out. Matter of fact, if you look at your calendar, Sunday is always begin as the first day of the week. Unfortunately, they will skip and some people they don't know they will count Monday as the first day of the week Because according to Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 the devil will deceive the whole world So it's a deception so the devil, you know, he's in the process blinding the people including the Christian though Friends if you go to church Sunday notice the first day church now you don't have the mark of the beast according to Revelation 14 and 13 unless the law it's an enforce. That's why now you hear different country they try to force in the people to not sell or do anything on Sunday because they try to enforce the law. But according to Bible, notice United States is the one who's going to cause the whole world to worship the beast. They are sun worship day, means Sunday worship, according to Revelation 13. So whenever United States enforce the law 
then every country also going to enforce because they control the whole world every president on the roman catholic church when our founders declared a new order of the ages they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled daniel 11 verses 42 and 43 he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his stand. According to Revelation 16, whenever National Sunday Law or Sunday Law come to history, if you accept Sunday Law, you're going to receive the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture. That's why God is warning the whole world right now that we don't have to receive the mark of the beast. Constantine was the one who united the church and state together. And according to Roman Catholic all court leaders, papacy themselves, they say Sunday is their mark of authority because they the one they change the sabbath from saturday to sunday now because they control every president in every country they a new world order so now they're using the president to sign up laws and all kinds of rules like gay and lesbian and now they don't want you to talk about bible you know if you go to work they don't want you to talk about christ because you know they say it's offended they try to put the whole world in darkness they don't want people to know the truth just like what they did in dark ages they remove bible from people and they put people in darkness so that they can control them that's what they're doing again notice what bible says in Romans chapter 13 verse 11 to 12 and do this knowing the time that now was a high time to awake out of sleep now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed the night is far spent the day is at hand therefore let us cast off the walk of darkness and let us put on the armor of like the time you have spent to study Bible a year now you have to do with a couple of months it's time to pray more and talk less friends Jesus Christ is coming for the church without spot or wrinkle watch this when Nazi Germany attacked Britain in 1940, Winston Churchill called on his people to defend Christian civilization. Today, there is a new kind of battle in Britain, and Christianity is again at stake. Dale Hurd reports from London. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Like British monarchs before her, she promised to maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel. But Britain today is at war with the gospel and with itself. Christians who try to be Christians in the workplace risk being demoted or fired, and the government continues to push an aggressive gay rights agenda, while threatening to criminalize Christian speech and practice. Christian politician and activist George Hargraves. Yesterday, I got a letter from the Advertising Standards Authority of a complaint saying that my billboard that says Britain is a Christian country is offensive to atheists and other religions, and it incites hatred against them. What nonsense. Britain is constituted as a Christian country. Daily prayers are said in Parliament, whether atheists like it or not. The Queen is the head of the Church of England and therefore has to acknowledge God for her sovereignty over the nation. These things are written into, not just our culture and our heritage, but into our constitution. Great Britain is officially a Christian nation, and in fact at one time was the missionary base for the entire world, even sending missionaries to the new American colonies. But Britain today in practice is increasingly anti-Christian, and the cases of anti-Christian bigotry and discrimination are beginning to pile up. In response, Christian legal centers have mobilized. Lawyer Andrea Minicella Williams of Christian Concern for Our Nation warns that if British Christians don't step up now, Britain is on a path to criminalize the practice of Christianity in public. There's been a massive move by the secularist lobby to privatize religion. You can have faith so long as it doesn't affect you in the workplace, so long as you don't bring it into the workplace. Just make it private. It can't be public. It can't affect what you do in the public square. Christian Quabena Pete was forced to attend homosexual sensitivity training at work 
administered by a lesbian. One of the things that she said was when she asked the question, what makes you all think that to be heterosexual is natural? At which point I walked out. He then wrote a letter to the sensitivity trainer explaining the Bible's position on homosexuality and that God loved her and he loved her. He was suspended. They said that by me telling them about the word of God, it's constituted harassment and intimidation. Quabena was just recently reinstated. Cases like Quabena's are repeated over and over in Britain. Doctors, nurses, adoptive parents deemed unfit because of their Christian beliefs. Christians are told not to speak about God in the workplace or they're punished for offending homosexuals or Muslims. Now the British government wants to pass a new equality bill that would force churches to hire practicing homosexuals or transsexuals. Christian lawyer Paul Diamond has been very successful in fighting Christian discrimination cases in the courts. In the United Kingdom, the homosexual agenda is militant, and they've been arresting Christians, jailing Christians for hate crimes, shutting off grants, constant litigation with the government, constant aggression, there's no live and let live, your Christian values are wicked and evil and that's what they want everybody to believe. That sounds like a BBC program which portrayed a violent Christian beheading a Muslim. Britain's government TV has also put a Muslim in charge of all of its religious programming. Islam continues to advance in the UK in large part because the government and media give it almost a protected status, while essentially persecuting its own state religion, Christianity. Many believe the architect of Britain's new anti-Christian culture was former Prime Minister Tony Blair, who championed gay rights. And during our interviews with Minicello, Williams and Diamond, they both offered the same warning to American Christians, that any anti-life or hate crimes legislation under the Obama administration will erode America's Christian base. This is all coming to America if you liberalize the laws, as President Obama has done. You know who Obama reminds every British person of? Tony Blair. Charming, persuasive, convincing, um, appearance of moderation, and then shoved all the Judeo-Christian values down, saying he was a Christian as he did it. So we know what's going to happen in America. We know what's going to happen to your 40% church attendance. It isn't 40%, it's going to be 20%. When the, when the federal and state government start saying, if you criticize homosexuality, the hate crime laws will apply to you Christians. Dale Heard, CBN News, London. Friends, the Bible said that darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. One of the things that this Babylon, the Bible also says in Second Thessalonians, Chapter 2, if you get time, read it, because that's how you're going to know that this power is the Antichrist, because this is the doctrine, the old time, dark ages, the reformers, they used to preach, and they point to this power, Antichrist, but now you don't hear no more. One of the things that they're doing is they infiltrate almost every system, so they're using so-called movie stars, or famous, so to speak. And they train them how they can dress short shirts. And whenever they do that, because they know that if they wear any kind of shirt, the world is going to copy. And they're going to dress like them. So they come up with all kinds of Babylon pagan short shirt, half naked dress. The devil's binding the world together to receive the mark of the beast. And now the senses of rational being has become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make a right decision. They don't know how they dressed. They don't know how they eat. That's why Revelation chapter 18, God help us to understand that this world, this earth has become demonic. The hateful bird ever unclean.
Babylon religion confusion true mixed with lie. When they front of the camera, they pretend like humble people. Hypnosis, they hypnotize in the world. The Antichrist hiding in plain sight. The Bible called this system the mystery. It's a mystery for a lot of people. And according to Revelation chapter 13, the whole world will wonder after the beast. Whenever this power, the force, the mark of the beast, the world is going to be wonder. They're going to be like, we told they are humble, smooth walking, good people. the General Secretary of the Reformed Church in America. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. Clifton Kirkpatrick, the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. William J. Shaw, President of the National Baptist Convention, United States. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop James Leggett, General Superintendent of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Your Holiness, may I present Dr. Leith Anderson, President of the National Association of Evangelicals. Your Holiness, may I present Bishop David H. Benke, President of the Atlantic District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Dr. A. R. Bernard, Sr., President of the Council of Churches of the City of New York. Your Holiness, may I present Elder Bernice A. King, daughter of the civil rights leaders Martin Luther King, Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Your Holiness, may I present Reverend Jimmy Song Jilin, Executive Director of the Council of Churches of the City of New York. Your Holiness, may I present the Right Reverend Mark Sisk, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New York. You understand the language, Your Holiness, and this is how they call this power. He think he is God. That's what their teachings is all about. Friends, religious leaders, when they come to meet this power, they weren't black. Notice, dark color. They represent the sinners, and he represent God. And now listen to what Bible says. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the chapter the Protestant Sunday churches. They are forefathers. They used to protest against this power during dark ages. And they call them Antichrist. Notice Antichrist. But now you don't hear from Sunday churches anymore. Because they betray their forefathers. Let's start from verse 3. Notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. The son of predation. Who opposes and exalt himself above all that is called God. All that is worshipped. So that he sit as God in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Notice what it says in verse 7. 
for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Pope Francis met with the ecumenical and interreligious delegates March 20th, who had attended his inaugural mass the day before. The representatives included Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, and Jain leaders. Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople also had a private meeting with the new pope. Roman Catholic papacy or court leaders is spreading Indians herd that is sacrificed for the devils. Mesh originally came from Indians. Many have no hesitation in giving the only thing they possess. A oh, man. Yeah, not too bad, not too bad, my friend. It's a wonderful day here in Rome. Freezing, but it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, I spoke to the office earlier on. They said there's uh, some hair coming in. Yeah, that's really good, because I think it was in Fiumicino right now, being uh, disinfested. And uh, I think they're delivering it today. Can you send me an email with the lengths and the number of cartons, please? All right, so listen, when am I going to see you when you come into Rome? Really? But keep that hair coming, bro. Keep that hair coming. That's it, man. Keep it flowing like the River Nile. 100 kilos of hair, and it cost us about uh, approximately about 100,000 US dollars. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Man, you work on that immediately and send it back ASAP, as soon as you can. That's right. That's right. You better keep that a secret, yeah? Exactly. <laughs> all over the world, my friend, all over the world. Listen, I've seen, I've seen your uh, new price list. Okay, we just have to make some calculations because, of course, the prices are, uh, are very high. Yeah, yeah, no, this is understood. I mean, the, the quality is undisputable. I mean, we were really, really happy with the quality, so that's, uh, that goes without saying. Because I understand the difficulty in supplying uh, only long hair. Uh, basically, what happens is that the supplier is left with tons of short hair. Sagita Wadwani, executive editor of Hello Magazine. Welcome to Young Turks. Thank you. Okay, Sagita, 10 years in the business. How's the journey been for you? I joined with Elle and uh, it was a very dynamic, very competitive team. Everybody was scrambling to make it to be the next big editor. And I learned a lot over there. I learned about, uh, it's basically, it's a women's magazine and we could read 29 editions from all over the world. The women were changing all over at the same time. Style can cost up to four thousand dollars, but for stars, it's as fabulous as you can get. Great lengths are the Rolls Royce of hair extensions. They're the creme de la creme of hair. Which is why every stunning starlet from Cameron Diaz to Kate Beckinsale to Celine Dion is wearing these top tresses. But what makes this hair so great? It's made from uncolored, never treated hair. And this hair is then collected in these sacred temples in India and shipped off to Hollywood. This battle is the final conflict of Satan himself to eradicate the Son of God from the minds of men. They're actually saying that this Jesus that is going to come is going to be different from the Jesus that already came. I believe with all my heart 
that Christianity is in the shaking period. What are we waiting for? A temple? So that the sacrificial system can be inaugurated again? Which pointed to a Messiah who has already come? That makes no sense. The Jesuit order, they set their own president in every country. They also create democracy and United Nations, how they can finish the new world order. And if your president don't submit to their rules and give their power to them, they will pretend like you have a new weapons and they will take you, they will set another president that will submit to their rules so that they can finish the new world order. Friends, Saturday is always the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Notice, and again, it's always Saturday, and that's why the Bible says the seventh day is the Sabbath. Jewish nation, even though I'm not Jewish, they still keep the Sabbath, Saturday, and also encyclopedia. You will find it even different language. If you speak Spanish, Sabado means Saturday. You can also find in the Bible, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, you're going to find that God created heaven and the earth six days, and the seventh day he rested. And that seventh day, it's Saturday. And then Jesus Christ, remember, when Adam and Eve they sinned, Jesus Christ came to redeem our soul and he finished his work six days, Friday afternoon. Remember, that's why they call it Easter Friday or Good Friday. It says it is finished Friday and then he rested Saturday, just like he rested Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And Sunday, the early day in the morning, you will find in the book of Luke chapter 24 verses 1 to 3. You will also find in Luke chapter 23 verses 50 to 56. The seventh day is always Saturday until Constantine 321. He changed it from Saturday to his own pagan son, creation, worship day. The devil behind the scene. You are about to see the power. God is going to fill us with his outpouring. Just like he did it for the first century. The apostle church. And then we're going to go forward and preach the loud cry. The third angel's message. We're going to protest against their pagan son worship day. Means their son day worship. And then Jesus Christ will come. Just like Bible says. If the day is not short. No flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake. Means those will take a stand. The day will be shortened. Friends. This is a beautiful time in history. Because we only one step. Away from heaven. The mark of the beast. The worship issue in Revelation chapter 13. If you get time. Read it. Because Revelation chapter 13 verse 12. It's a worship issue. And verse 15. It's a worship Worship issue and verse 8 is a worship issue and the Bible help us to understand that behind the scene Revelation 13 is the devil he wants the whole world to worship him friends you have to escape you have to study your Bible Christ is calling you whether you are Christian or not whenever you hear Sunday worship in any countries do not accept it God is going to protect you Bible says our bread and water will be sure your holiness on behalf of all of us gathered here today, indeed on behalf of all the people of our beloved nation, we welcome you back to America. Pope Francis greeted 132 official delegations that came to Rome to congratulate him and welcome his pontificate. He greeted them one by one in St. Peter's Basilica. The delegations that were highlighted the most were the ones from Argentina and Italy. The Vatican was quite busy. Among the heads of state and dignitaries, there were six current monarchs, 32 heads of state, three heirs to the throne, and 11 government leaders. From Latin America, 10 heads of state attended. Among them was Chilean President Sebastián Piñera, who along with his wife asked the Pope to bless a few religious items. The president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, brought his mother to the mass. Brazilian president Vilma Rousseff was also there, as well as Mexico's president Enrica Peña Nieto, whose wife gave the Pope a papal hat. Vice President Joe Biden led the delegation from the U.S. The Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, was also in attendance, as well as Spain's prince and princess, headed by the government's president, Mariano Rajoy. 
In countries where Christians are a minority, we're also represented. Countries like Bahrain, Morocco, Israel, and Turkey. The Pope greeted each one of the delegations and paid special attention to countries where wars or violent conflicts are an everyday reality. And before leaving the Basilica, the Pope took the time to greet and also thank the team who made sure everything was ready for him and his guests inside the Basilica. Including from Belgium and Monaco. There was a brief chat with Robert Mugabe and his wife. The president of Zimbabwe is a devout Roman Catholic. Behind him, in line and waiting to meet the Pope, leaders from the European Union. When a Catholic Jesuit learns Sunday churches, they are doctrine. And the Vatican II, when they infiltrate their churches, and they draw all their churches to so-called the model of the church, because they know their doctrine, and they can answer questions and preach. So the members of the Sunday churches, they think that all the pastors are faithful pastors. So now it's all about my pastor says, my pastor says, my pastor says. And this is the crying that a lot of times you hear from them. Instead of them to study, to show thyself approved, just like Bible says, they're making the flesh their right arm. And some of them, when they learn the Sabbath truth, that is always Saturday, because their pastors has been hematized them for so many years. So when they go and they talk to their pastors, Instead of them to talk to God and make decision based on that says the Lord, they make their pastors make decision for them because that's how bad they hematize them. They come right out and state exactly how they infiltrate any religious group they want. They'll come in pretending to be a Pentecostal, pretending to be a Baptist, taking the leadership role and then completely subverting it from the inside. Friends, don't let the devil use hypnosis preachers, whether as the pastor or whoever they are, to tell you that you're not going to be holy. You're going to sin until Jesus Christ come. That's doctrines of the devils. When God says, be you holy because I'm a holy. When Jesus Christ sets you free, Bible says, ye shall be free indeed. If you think that God is bigger than the devil, then you're going to be holy by the grace of God. But if you think that you're the devil, notice your devil is bigger than God, then the devil going to make sure that he keep you in darkness. He will keep you to sin until Jesus Christ come, and then you're going to be doomed, friends. God, his creation power. Genesis, when God said, let there be light. And there was light. So when God said, be, means his creation power. You can be holy by the grace of God. This is the old gospel. And now the devil's using, a, you know, hypnosis pastors. You know, all they want is, you know, money, riding Mercedes and all kinds of expensive vehicles. They fail to be a Bible Christian. Christ is calling a humble instrument. It's time to take a stand. Forget yourself. Don't look for what's in it for you. It's time to look for what's in it for God. That's how apostles and disciples, they live. In the first century, Jesus Christ is coming for the remnant church. Miss left over. Our character, our life star is going to be like the first century, the church that Jesus Christ set up. Christ is coming. Believe that you're going to be holy. He's going to help you. It depends how you program yourself. If you are watching a Jesuit, Hollywood, worldly program, so-called television program, then the devil's going to use those pagans or infidels to preach you and you're going to be in darkness until Jesus Christ comes. TB Joshua would engage all known mind control techniques to keep his disciples in check. Sleep deprivation was his standard and the cruel punishments he meted out for the slightest offenses were calculated to induce fear. Snitching was the order of the day and he had the ability to disorientate the best of men. Disciples dared not converse freely for fear of punishment. Gradually, the disciples would be led into working out his deceptions to fool the public becoming tools in his propaganda machine. I was made a prophet 
in June 12, 1999, on his birthday. From then, the powers invested in me increased. I became a terror to co-disciples. People run away from me because I will do whatever he asked me to do. Any disciple he asked me to slap, I will slap. That the genuine church was also involved in some of the same tricks to a lesser degree? How many more ministers like Chris Oyakilume did he taint with the spirit of deception? No one need say that his case is hopeless, that he can't live the life of a Christian. Ample provision is made by the death of Christ for every soul. Jesus is our ever-present help in time of need. Only call upon him in faith, and he has promised to hear and answer your petitions. Oh, for living active faith, we need it, we must have it, or we shall fade and fail in the day of trial. The darkness that will then rest upon our path must not discourage us or drive us to despair. It is now that we must keep ourselves and our children unspotted from the world. It is now that we must wash our robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. It is now that we must overcome pride, passion, and spiritual slothfulness. It is now that we must awake and make determined effort for symmetry of character. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. We are in a most trying position, waiting, watching for our Lord's appearing. The world is in darkness. But ye brethren, says Paul, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving man or woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men or women of false tongues or deceitful hearts. All who receive the seal must be without spot before God, candidates for heaven. Search the scriptures for yourselves, that you may understand the fearful solemnity of the present hour. This parable video will blow up your mind, so watch it carefully. Matthew 13:34 says that Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables and transport a person through time, as in time travel. This is impossible. No, it is possible, Russell. My only regret is that my father never experienced time travel himself. Then how do you know it works? I tested it. You tested it? You traveled through time? Yes, I traveled over 100 years into the future. <laughs> over 100 years to the 20th, no, the 21st century? Correct. You? <laughs> this is an absurdity. It is the truth, Russell. No, as time travel is impossible, I'm afraid that your illness has affected your judgment more than I thought. My friend, time travel is possible. What proof can you provide? I tried to acquire some physical evidence, but the machine will not allow me to bring anything back from the future. And why not? Well, I have reasoned it was because the article would not yet exist. It would be impossible for me to show you a coin from the 1950s before it was even minted. Of course. It would not have been minted yet. I see. This is why I have arranged the journey for you. A journey? For me? Yes. Into the future. <laughs> oh, come now. Russell, you must see where the teaching of good morals alone will lead. You must see for yourself what happens when we remove the authority of Christ out of life. You've gone way beyond reason here, Norris. This is all nonsense. Now, you needn't worry about your wife or your classes. Your entry point will be a remote alley in the city where I made my entry. Norris, as I have... You must be at that same point on Wednesday by 9 o'clock. Norris, please, I have come to reason with you. This is a timing mechanism. When it becomes 9 p.m. on Wednesday night, it will activate the transporter and bring you back. This is how I traveled alone. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
How may I help you? Are you the proprietor of this establishment? The proprietor? You mean the owner? No. He's not here. He's my father. Uh, how may I help you? I would like to comment in regards to those women garments on display over there. Well, I don't think they'd look very good on you. I beg your pardon? Just kidding. Just a joke, mister. I know, I know. You know your wife would look just great in that outfit over there, and you want to see if I can work out a special deal? I think we can work something out. I am not wishing to purchase that garment, sir. Huh? I do not know how this will be taken by you, but I am sure this manner of dress arouses sinful passions in the customers as they walk by. Sinful passions? Yes, sinful passions of promiscuity, especially in the younger males. We must be careful as to the example we portray to our young people, for the goodness of all society. Sir, I appreciate you voicing your opinion, and I'll be sure to let my father know, and I want to thank you. But to be honest, this is the first complaint we've had like this. Our customers, most of them don't seem to mind this sort of thing, okay? in the name of the Lord. There must be some mistake. You must stop this movie. This is an abomination. I just simply mentioned the Bible. I meant no harm by it. And the teacher informed me that she could lose her job over the matter. Well, our nation is no longer built on the biblical principles set forth by our forefathers. We haven't been able to study the Bible in public school for years. We've lost prayer in school since the Supreme Court decision in what, 1962? Children not allowed to pray in school? How unthinkable. Well, we're part of a society that, for the most part, lives without Christ and his word. Last evening, something very shocking occurred. I attended a movie with a group from the church, and the person up on the screen blasphemed the name of the Lord. Unfortunately, that happens all the time. Oh, I, I know, because I used to be in the film industry. <laughs> As a player up there on the screen? As an actor? No. No, <laughs> no I was a booking agent for a theater chain. I was making all kinds of money, the whole package. But I was miserable inside, empty. And then one day, an old girlfriend of mine came by the office and we were talking and, and I told her how I felt. And she told me that she felt the same way before she became a Christian. That she accepted Christ in her life and committed to follow him. And she was so happy. Well, I say all of that because when it comes to the film industry, I've been there and I know how powerful and influential it is to society. I believe that secular entertainment is one of the biggest tools that Satan uses to mislead people. He, he desensitizes us through it. Murder, violence, sexual immorality, you name it. 
sin has slowly but surely become acceptable to us because we see it all the time. So it, it's no longer shocking to us. But why were these things ever allowed? Well, frankly, I think that Satan's smarter than we give him credit for. And he's very deceptive. When the movie industry started back in the 30s, it was moralistic for the most part. There was a censor board that regulated what could not could not be shown on the screen. And movie makers were very careful about what they were portraying. And that's when the people didn't realize that the devil won his greatest victory. His greatest victory? How so? Because he got the name and the person of Jesus Christ out of the movies. I mean, the morals were there for a while. But the Lord himself was not. And as people became more liberated with their views, there seemed to be less and less conviction because there was no absolute authority. And that is why people can curse the name of the Lord and they don't even think about it. But how can these movie makers so mock the Lord? Do they not understand that he is the one who created them and gives them their every breath? Mr. Carlisle, it says in the Bible that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If people don't hold reverence for the Lord, what can we expect? I must admit I was very surprised when Pastor asked me to speak with you. Let me say that the lifestyle I have been observing here these past few days has been at the very least startling. In the third chapter of Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul warns us about the last days. In verses 1 through 5, the scriptures say that in the last days, men will be selfish, proud, without natural affection for one another, unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. The list goes on. From what I have seen, the state that this society is now in reminds me of the days of Noah just prior to entering the ark and of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Sin appears to be as blatant and as open now as it was then. Surely these must be the last days that Paul is referring to. And the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. The Lord God who created all things appears to have been eliminated from your schools, your government, businesses, attacked in the arts and in your entertainment and through these amazing inventions of the radio television and the movies the devil has mightily planted sinful thoughts and ideas and alternatives in the minds of the people so much so that jesus christ and what he did what he stands for and who he is has been lost my friends, I urge you this evening, as I have personally done this past week, to first reconsider your own relationship with God through Christ. Please be abundantly clear that you have truly submitted yourself to Jesus and received him into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. We know that Jesus will not save any man he cannot command. And if you are playing a game of pretend with the Lord tonight, if you know deep in your heart you have never truly submitted to him, or if you're unsure of your standing with Christ, now is the time to make yourself right with God by calling out to Christ. One final judgment will come upon mankind and all those who do not come under the covering of Christ. Please give your life to Jesus Christ right now. Your eternity will depend on it. I've said enough. Pastor? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Carlisle. Uh, I'm sure that we will take what you said to heart. All right, then, as the men prepare to pass out the voting materials, um, why don't we all stand together and sing another hymn? How about Amazing Grace? Hmm?
to go somewhere? Gentlemen, do not come any closer. You must leave here immediately. There's not much time. Not much time for what? I'm afraid I'm not allowed to explain, but you must leave immediately. Look, we've had enough of your little secrets, Carlisle. I want the truth, and I want it now. Gentlemen, I highly advise you to leave this area at once. I'm taking you downtown for some questioning, unless you tell us what's going on right now. I appreciate your concern, gentlemen, but you must understand, I have not hurt anyone, nor do I intend to. Now, please, for your own safety. We're not leaving, Carlisle. I'm a messenger sent from the Lord. A messenger from the Lord? Yes, and I've been sent to warn you that Jesus is coming. Look, Carlisle, don't make us use force. You've only been gone for a few moments. Norris, the future. Oh, my heavens, where does one begin? It is incredible. But sin abounds. The Lord is not feared. Morals have replaced Christ, and with liberal teachings. The families are in disarray. No authority, no respect. The world lives without Jesus, while the church seems to be filled with professing Christians who do not follow the Lord they claim to believe. Yes, it appeared to be this way. I was wrong in my thinking. Very wrong, Norris. To separate the authority of Jesus from his teachings is indeed deadly, as I have just witnessed the end result. Yes, it would lead many astray. I'm so sorry I doubted you, my friend. It took great courage to do what you did, and I am forever grateful. We have been given a great privilege. We must use it for good. Yes, indeed. Well, I have some crucial rewriting to do, sir. I understand. Norris, I believe I was witnessing the last days. Rome's reaction to the Constitution of the United States, of course, was not favorable because the whole papal system was built on the union of church and state. As our president talks about how we want to bring democracy to all these countries of the world. Well, why doesn't he want to bring a republic to these countries? We were a republic. We were never a democracy. The Jesuits had really assumed universal political power by 1750. As that book, Justin Fulton, that great author, right? Washington on the Lap of Rome, it was written about 1888. Washington on the Lap of Rome, written by this great preacher, Justin Fulton. And it shows how he calls it Rome and the Potomac, completely controlled by the Archbishop of Baltimore. There was a secret wire between Baltimore and the White House telling the president what to do, at least since the days of Grover Cleveland. Historian Thomas Hobbes says, if a man consider the origin of the great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the grave thereof. Pope Leo said, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Some have come to the conclusion that Rome has changed that she has repented of her bloody megalomanic past. But these evidences revealed in the very current acts and views of the system should send a clear signal to the world that Rome never changes. Uh, America was founded as a Christian nation, but it was also founded as an occult nation. And there have always been two parallel forces here in America. One the Christian, one the occult, dating back into the 1600s. And until you understand that, you can't understand anything going on in the world today. So the Pope, because he believes he's God on earth, he always dresses in white. And that's why every political visitor to the Pope always dresses in black. The Orthodox, the Muslim, the Eastern religion, sun worship, Zoroastrism, all of them bow down to Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 11. We are living in the time of the end. 
The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already falling upon the despisers of the grace of God. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war pretentious. They forecast the approaching events of the greatest magnitude. Talking about the time of the end, but notice what it goes on to say in volume 9, page 11 to verse, uh, rather page 14. On one occasion when in New York City, what city? New York. I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story to heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners and the builders. Higher and still higher these buildings arose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belong were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engine could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. You have two 110 story office buildings. The building collapsed to dust. September 11, 2001. World Trade Center attacked, fulfillment of prophecy, connected with the book of Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 because after that it says going on the world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th uh, chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place and it begins in volume 9 page 11. Recognizing that we're talking about Daniel 11 being placed in the events, verse 40, beginning in 1798, but also being placed between the events of 1989 to September 11, 2001. This is the message of the third angel for our day. But not only did those buildings come down, there's something else that came down as well with it. Notice this next statement, Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. How comes the word that I've declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave? This I've never said. I have said as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. What are the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3? You go and read it. It says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven and the earth uh, with great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The great city, which the Bible speaks about how it has become the habitation of devils. And it is the, the hold and, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The hold and, and, and foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the merchants of the earth are also rich and they, they wax rich and, and abundantly uh, through her delicacies. In other words, Revelation 18.1. It's talking about the mighty angel coming down from heaven. Who is that mighty angel that comes down from heaven in Revelation 18? It's the same mighty angel that came down in Revelation chapter 10. In other words, what brought him down? It was the fulfillment of the third woe of the seventh trumpet dealing with Islam. When Islam was restrained on 9-11-2001 and the whole world came together to deal with the issue of radical Islam. It was a repeat of the Millerite history when in Revelation chapter 10 verse 1 you had the mighty angel come down from heaven. He was clothed with a cloud. He has a rainbow over his head. His face shines like the sun. Feet like pillars of fire. He has one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea and he has a little book open in his hand. That little book was the book of Daniel and when he cried he roared like when a lion roared and seven thunders uttered their voices. In other words, when did he come down? 
in Revelation 10. It was based upon a prophecy in the sixth trumpet of the second woe, August 11th, 1840, 391 years and 15 days when Islam once again was restrained by the four European powers of England, Russia, Austria, and Prussia. At this time, when everyone saw the Ottoman Empire collapse, based upon Josiah Litch's a reckoning of the 391 years and 15 days, he predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1838. When that prophecy was fulfilled, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the prophetic principles of Miller. And then all of a sudden, a wonderful impetus and a wonderful power came into the movement as men of learning and talent joined with Miller in proclaiming the first angel's message. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. In other words, August 11, 1840, Christ the mighty angel comes down to empower the first angel's message, Daniel 8, 14. Because now, if you can predict the fall of the Ottoman Empire, a, a nation from Bible prophecy, if you can predict it just simply using a, the year-to-day principle, then what you're saying about... The 23rd of days, Jesus coming, must be true. And so a power comes into the movement. The midnight cry message. The first angel is carried to every missionary station in the world. But all of a sudden, history is repeated. On September 11, 2001, the mighty angel comes down. When those towers come down. And once again, he has a little book open in his hand. But it's not Daniel 8, 14. It's Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, and he was bidding his students of prophecy to take the book and to eat it, that the third angel's message might be empowered, that they also might be prepared to receive the beginning of the outpouring of the latter rain. In fact, notice this statement here. This statement coming from Review and Herald, April 21st, 1891. Notice what happens. Review and Herald, uh, t April 21st, 1891. The latter rain is to fall upon the people of God. A mighty angel is to come from heaven and the whole earth is to be lightened with his glory. What angel is that? That's Revelation 18. So when that angel comes down, the latter rain comes down with him. And it says... Are we ready to partake in the glorious work of the third angel? Are our vessels ready to receive the heavenly dew? Have we defilement and sin in the heart? If so, let us cleanse the soul temple and prepare for the showers of the latter rain. The refreshing from the presence of the Lord will never come to hearts filled with impurity. May God help us to die to self and at Christ the hope of glory may be formed within. You say, wait a minute. I thought the latter rain begins in earnest at the Sunday law. There is a sprinkling or a breathing of the Spirit of God to prepare for the full outpouring of the latter rain. Listen to this statement here. This is the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 242. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 242, it says, The act of Christ in breathing upon his disciples the Holy Ghost and in imparting his peace to them was as a few drops before the plentiful showers to be given on the day of Pentecost. In other words, in John 20, when Christ breathed on them the Holy Spirit, receive you the Holy Ghost, that was like a sprinkling, a few drops. What was the few drops for? It was to prepare them to get into the upper room. What did they do in the upper room? They prayed. They, they uh, uh, searched their hearts. They confessed their sins. They fasted, but they were also studying prophecy as well. And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that when they were on one accord that the Holy Spirit fell on them and that Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost falling was prefiguring the latter rain, which also prefigures the Millerite history, which also prefigures our day and age. In other words, 9-11 begins to mark the sprinkling as Islam is restrained. And we'll speak more about that, but the seventh trumpet, third woe, empowering Daniel 11, 40 to 45, like the sixth trumpet, second woe, empowered Daniel 8, 14, the Millerite message. We have a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What should we be doing, brethren, in the light of these revelations from God's word? We should be doing what we're doing tonight, gathering together, 
gathering together, not when the decree is passed, before the decree brings forth. Gathering together and studying the Word of God and seeking to bring our lives into agreement, seeking righteousness and meekness that we might be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. How can we be sure, brethren, that we are living upon the ends of the world to come? How can we be sure that we are living in the final verses of Daniel 11, 40 to 45? Look with me in Zephaniah chapter 1, is verse 14. The Bible says in Zephaniah 1, 14, it says here, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasted if greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble. And distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high tower. The day of the trumpet against the fenced cities and the high tower. What trumpet? What high towers? The high towers of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. What trumpet? The seventh trumpet, the third woe. Verse 17, And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. In other words, after 9-11-2001, distress came upon the nations. Oh, was there distress upon the nations in the time period of the Millerites? Yes, it was. We'll deal with that later on. But notice now in verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a spitty radiance of all them that dwell in the land. What do you mean that their gold and silver won't be able to deliver them? Economic collapse, economic financial crisis. What happened on 9-11? The world was stirred with a spirit of war. All of a sudden, the president of the United States says, listen, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. And they've been fighting in this six-year, seven-year war. And what's happened as a result of that? 2008 economic crisis. Do you know that that's the same thing that the Spirit of Prophecy says in volume 9, page 11 to 14? It says that those that hold the reins of government are not able to solve the problems of moral corruption and, and, and poverty and increasing crimes. It says that they're struggling in vain to hold business operations on a more secure basis. We see that happening as a result of 9-11 and also that war that's been taking place. 9-11, economic crisis. What comes after the economic crisis? Chapter 2 and verse 1 tells us, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation, not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, and may be, you shall be hid. In the day of the Lord's anger. The decree that's about to bring forth. The day that passes as the chaff. Is the Sunday law. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 to 7. The Bible says that the first angel's message is warning the whole world to stay away from sin. Because God says fear God and give him glory. So if the people stay away from sin or not sinning, means they fear God and they have given him glory. The second angel in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 says, Babylon is fallen and is fallen. It's this system that is confused. This pagan one world government satanic religion that is putting the whole world in darkness is fallen. The third angel's message in Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 to 11 says, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, that person also going to receive the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture. 
misses his full rap whenever they fall Sunday law. If you accept that Sunday law, that means you already received the mark of the beast. Today's Sunday Law News Report features an interesting news item that ought to make you sit up and pay close attention. Now, take a look at this. It's a massive encounter with the Pope. The family's coming from five continents for this special pilgrimage and some one-on-one -on -one time with the Bishop of Rome himself. This morning, the Pope is once again breaking from tradition. This time at an annual event for families, where 150,000 families from 70 countries join the Pope in Rome to profess their faith. Now, for the first time, hundreds of children and elderly people are standing side by side with the Pope, instead of in the audience, emphasizing the importance of different generations. The Pope saying rest. Saturday, so many families are there. The Vatican City wants to be known as the capital of the family. The Pope says he'll close out the event, blessing all families around the world. What an event, huh? And quite an event. You know, it's really interesting. There was a report out this morning that says tourism in Rome has actually gone up no since kidding. this Pope yeah, arrived. His popularity wow. continues to rise. Amazing. Great to see you, Gio. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Who doesn't want a social day devoted to families? Who doesn't desire a day where the emphasis is on love for our family and everyone else's? It's a great idea in light of the current attack on traditional family values. But let's take a closer look at this, shall we? When we shine the light of the gospel onto this new satanic effort to recognize Sunday as the day of rest, we'll see that this is just the beginning of persecution for Sabbath keepers. The first world meeting of families took place in 1994 and subsequent annual meetings took place in Rio de Janeiro, Rome, Manila, uh, Milan, and again last year in Rome. The Pope has appointed the next Family Day meeting to be held in Philadelphia in 2015. Now friend, what does all this mean? What is this Family Day all about? The Pope desires that all families have a work-free Sunday. Families should be free from work so that on Sunday, children could be together with their parents and relatives and go to church as well. The Pope also suggests that we should discover the true meaning of Sunday observance on this family day. The good news of the family is a very important witness of evangelization, which Christians can communicate to everyone by being witnesses to life. True Christian families are recognized for their faithfulness, patience, openness to life, and their respect for the elderly. Pope Francis was speaking to participants of the 21st Plenary Assembly of the Pontifical Council for the Family. The Holy Father reminded the participants the family is based on marriage, which he called like a first sacrament of humanity. He said the church must give attention and show spiritual closeness to all families in need, those forced to leave their homelands, those that are broken, those who are homeless or without work, spouses suffering problems, including those who have separated. Now it's interesting that the UN and the Vatican are working together for this Family Day, which will be each and every Sunday. Families will have a rest upon this day, be together with the children and go to church, and so on. Do you see the strategy? The Pope desires to promote Sunday as the day of rest for all families throughout the world. He calls Sunday the Family Day. The previous Pope Benedict said, and I quote, by defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. Benedict said this during his weekly general audience in St. Peter's Square, just after he had attended a family day gathering in Milan, Italy. Pope also said, and I quote, Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone, so people can be free to be with their families and with God. The Pope clearly stated that he wanted to come to the defense of free time, which is threatened by a kind of bullying, he says, 
through the demands of work. He continued, Sunday is a day of the Lord and of a man, and of man, a day which everyone must be able to be free, free for the family and free for God. This is in the Catholic News Service, June 2012. There it is, friend, straight from the beast himself. Friend, this is so crystal, crystal clear. The next step is the enforcement of a Sunday law. Everything else is now in place. Everyone else is on board and now only waiting for life to be breathed into the Sunday law. So when the Pope says that we should have Sunday as a day of rest for the family, he's promoting the counterfeit, unbiblical day of rest. Sunday means the S-U-N day and not the S-O-N day. The test lies before us whether we will worship Him who created heaven and earth and all that is in them, or we will worship the beast and receive its mark. This is dealing with worship, my friend. Whom will you worship and serve? Will you have God as your authority or will you have the Pope as your authority? Will you be loyal to the Creator or will you be loyal to people and their laws against God's law? This is the test that lies right before us. May the Holy Spirit help you, and may God help you as you follow Him. Cari amici, ieri, martedì 15 maggio, si è celebrata la giornata internazionale delle famiglie. Marking the World Day for the Family this week, Pope Benedict has appealed for the right to work and to rest for families worldwide. Appeal fra due questioni strettamente connesse. In comments following his Wednesday lesson on prayer and the life of the early church, the Holy Father said, work should not hinder the family but rather support and unite it, helping it to be open to life and to enter into a relationship with both society and within the church. The Holy Father also hoped that Sunday, the Lord's Day, and our weekly celebration of his resurrection will be a day of rest and an opportunity to strengthen the family bonds. <laughs> I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is a law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in a reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. T. N. Wright, CSSR, in a lecture at Hartford, Kansas, February 18, 1884. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Mirror, September 23, 1893. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Peter Geierman, The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 2nd edition, 1910, page 50. Friends, take a stand. Christ is coming. He loved you so much so that when he was on the cross, Jesus Christ says, I thirst. So whenever you're in temptation, remember when he says, I thirst because of you and I. Order the great controversy. Notice the book, The Great Controversy, because it's preparation. It will prepare you by the grace of God. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. He says, the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the enemy only comes to do three things, to steal, kill, 
and destroy the truth. That's what he's trying to do. So now let's travel back in time 4,000 years and begin to discover where the history of some of these traditions came from. We're going to find ourselves all the way back in the time of Noah. Matter of fact, let's begin in the old-fashioned way. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there lived a man named Nimrod. Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. He was the most popular man on the earth at the time. Matter of fact, he was the king of the then known world. He was responsible for building the cities of, of Babel and all, the Tower of Babel and the city of Nineveh amongst others. Well, all that being aside, Nimrod no doubt had tremendous influence among the people that he was with. And what happened was uh, he had this uh, uncanny uh, reputation of strength. Uh, he created great uh, armies and uh, he, he was the ruler of the then known world right after the flood. He was full of idolatry and covetousness, drunkenness, and uh, rebellious, rebelliousness towards God. And he had a phenomenal ability to deceive. Matter of fact, I suppose he was much like, a, I guess, an early politician 4,000 years ago. But Nimrod married a woman named Semiramis. Now, Semiramis and, and Nimrod would became basically king and queen of the then known world. Well, at some point, Nimrod dies and he became deified. He was the very first person that was ever deified on planet Earth. And they made him the sun god, which ended up being Baal. The word Baal in your scriptures can be traced back to Nimrod. So it's an interesting uh, reality of history when you see Baal and Ashtaroth, you're ending up coming all the way back to this story of Nimrod and Semiramis. And so Baal is now ruling the universe as the sun god and somehow luck has it through the Babylonian legend that Semiramis gets pregnant by the rays of the son of her deceased husband Nimrod and she gives birth to a young baby boy named Tammuz. Now further down in the story as Tammuz grows and becomes a man Tammuz actually marries his mother and they have a very uh, sexual relationship and that baby Tammuz and his mother Semiramis is where you get the story of Cupid. Cupid it, during Valentine's Day is how the story of Valentine's Day developed was from uh, Tammuz who married a, a very uh, unbiblical relationship uh, with his mother. Okay back to the story of Tammuz. So Tammuz for 40 years was a tremendous hunter and he took the place of his father ruling the world and had tremendous power but more than anything he was a credible hunter but unfortunately his gift and his skill of hunting caught up with him one day because he was killed during his 40th year by a wild boar every spring uh, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox the spring equinox they have what was called Ishtar's, uh, Ishtar's Sunday and they would have a sunrise service at the sunrise service, the priest of Ishtar uh, would impregnate young virgins on the altar and during that same service they would take the babies that were now three months old from the previous year and they would sacrifice those children on the altar to Ishtar and then they would take the eggs of Ishtar and they would dip those eggs in the blood of those young infants. And that is where we get sunrise services and uh, that is potentially where we get the dying of Easter eggs. It is also interesting to note that the worldwide universal color of Easter eggs is red. Even the White House, the official color of the White House Easter egg is ruby red. Now, back to Tammuz. Tammuz gets killed by a wild boar. So every year in commemoration of celebrating the death and the deification of Tammuz, which became the son of God, the son of his father, they would set aside 40 days prior to Easter in, and they would fast and they would pray and they would have a giant feast on Easter Sunday where they would celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of Tammuz. And guess what they would have for dinner on that Sunday evening? You got it, Easter ham. They would kill a boar in commemoration to Tammuz, who was killed by a wild boar. And yes, the 40 days prior to Easter, 
uh, we call it Lent, or the Catholics call it Lent, that 40 days did not come from, my friends, the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. That 40 days was already in place for thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. It comes from the 40 days of fasting and praying for Tammuz before they celebrated Easter. I'm going to give you some of the names and, and what they're most commonly uh, remembered for in these different cultures, and some of you will recognize them immediately. First of all, in Egypt, they were known as Isis and Osiris. In Phoenicia, they were recognized as Asheroth and Baal, the very same Asheroth and Baal that you see in the scriptures. In Greece, they were Aphrodite and Adonis, or Eros, where we get the word erotic from. And in Rome, they were called Venus and Cupid. That's right, that's where we get Valentine's Day from and Cupid. Even in the Far East, listen to this, this is amazing, Cupid was known as Zoroaster. Zoroaster is made up of two words, Zoro, which means seed of, and Asheroth, which is Easter. And so what Cupid actually means in the Far East is the seed of Easter, or the seed of his mother. Okay. God always tries to speak to the Israelites and warn them to stay away from Asheroth and Baal. Let's read the scriptures. Judges chapter 2 verse 13 says this, And they forsook Yahweh and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 1 Samuel chapter 7 verse 4 says, Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and served Yahweh only. And last but not least in Romans chapter 11 verse 4 it says, But what says the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Right about this time, you're probably having that thought that I warned you about hit your brain, saying, that's not what it means to me. I celebrate the birth of Jesus, and I put all the focus on Jesus, and I celebrate his resurrection, his resurrection and I want to focus on him. Well, your heart may be to want to focus on him, and you absolutely may do that. But the truth of the matter is, is that it doesn't matter how much we focus, how sincere we are, and how pure our hearts are, it only matters, that are we worshiping Him the way that He asks us to worship Him, and is anything that we're doing offending Him? Well, later on in the program, we're going to go through the Scriptures and see if there are any Scriptures talking about Christmas and Easter and any particular instructions allowing us to worship Him in whatever way that we want. But in the meantime, please keep an open mind as we move through the rest of this history and some of these symbols, which are very shocking, that you're going to find out how they moved through time and ended up in our Christian churches today. Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. If you look on your screen, you're going to see Isis and Osiris, or this is Ishtar and Tammuz. Now, some of you may be uh, asking, well, wait a minute, uh, I celebrate Easter, you're talking about Ishtar. Easter is actually the Anglicization of the word Ishtar. In other words, if you say Ishtar in English, it's pronounced Easter. That's how the etymology of that word evolved over time. What I want you to see is I want you to see what's on her head is a crescent moon, and in the center of that crescent moon is the actual sun itself. And so the symbol of power of uh, Isis, or Ishtar, was the crescent moon holding the sun itself, her deceased husband, Baal, the sun god. And you can see the baby there that is nursing from her breast. Ishtar was known as the goddess of the east, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east, or the sunrise, which is why they had the service at sunrise on Easter morning. Here on your screen, you see a pagan carving of the solar deity Baal Hadad, depicted as a disc in a crescent. Okay, you can see the, the half-moon disc there in the center of your screen with the, with the sun that is cradled inside of it. And that is the sun god as well as the, as the crescent moon that, it, that surrounds it. Now, as you see that the main symbol for the sun god was the crescent moon with the sun on the top of it or centered and cradled inside that crescent moon, we now move to something that's a bit controversial but very true historically, is the Catholic Eucharist is actually the sun that is inside of that crescent moon. I'm going to show you some pictures 
of the actual Eucharist in different positions, and you're going to see that not only is it similar, it's identical. This is where they got the symbols from. You can see here, this is a particular object that holds uh, the Eucharist, and I found this online, and this is what the quote said. I left off the particular church for obvious reasons, but this was their advertisement for a particular Friday. It says, Eucharistic adoration is held on the first Friday of every month for the purpose of honoring and praying to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, I don't know about you, but my Bible says to pray to the Father, our Father. Yeshua, Jesus said to pray to the Father. He did not say to pray to inanimate objects, whether they represent Him or not. Now, look very carefully at, on the right-hand side, you can see the moon, the crescent moon shaped holding that sun or that wafer of bread. Here's a close-up of it right here. The crescent moon cradle with the sun-shaped monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church. And now you'll see that it's actually the rays of the sun go all the way around this. They didn't hide it at all. Why did they hi not hide it? Because this is thousands of year old. This comes right out of paganism and sun god worship where it was the symbol of Baal and his wife Ishtar. And right here you can see the pine cone staff is another symbol found in paganism that's connected with the sun god uh, coming out of Egypt, Osiris. It's kind of in a form of a pitchfork, you can see, where the pine cone is in the center. Now, why did they choose a pine cone? Because a pine cone represents fertility. It, it is, comes from the pine tree, which stays green all year round. And so as it, everything began to die in the winter, the pine tree became a symbol of new hope and life and fertility. And you can see that uh, even in Mexico, they found a Mexican god that is holding a pine cone on one hand, pine cones on one hand, and the pine cone tree on the other. Now what's interesting is the largest pine cone structure in the world can be found in the court of the pine at the Vatican itself. Let me ask a question, why is a pine cone being found in the court of the pine at the Vatican? Why did they choose a pine cone? Why is it that the pine cone can be found on the staff of the Pope himself? Because this staff goes all the way back to ancient sun god worship where it represented power and authority of the gods, you see. And this is a close-up of that staff right here where the pine cone is embedded right in the staff itself. Let's move on to another symbol. This is the symbol of the trident. The trident is a, a, the devil's pitchfork. It really is a symbol of Satan, of the horns of Satan. It's an ancient satanic and pagan hand gesture called the trident. We find this in archaeology all over the place. Whenever you get into any kind of society of sun god worship, you find the trident everywhere. You see it in ancient Babylon. It was placed in the hands of all the pagan sun gods. All the pagan gods and pharaohs had some sort of of trident, a staff, that they would be connected to power and authority of the gods. The most famous one, of course, is Neptune's trident. We call it the devil's pitchfork, and that's where it comes from. It's just not a drawing that someone made up. This has history built into it of where these things come from. Now, if you move forward in time, or during the same time period, excuse me, you're going to find another symbol that is even more important. As a matter of fact, you're going to see two symbols in this picture. This is a pagan statue of Jupiter that has been renamed St. Peter. And he's holding up, guess what? The trident symbol. That symbol is a satanic symbol recognizing the power of the gods of the sun. And you'll also see another a symbol in this picture, and that is the halo. Look real carefully. It's not a halo. It's a sunburst. What they put behind the heads of the gods, or the saints, if you will, is not a halo. It is a sunburst rec representing the power of the sun god. And they call this St. Peter in the Vatican, but in reality, history tells us this is the god Jupiter. You also see what is... Baby Jesus, supposed to be J baby Jesus, is none other than baby Tammuz. And how do we know it's not Jesus? Because you see trident all over the place. 
you see the trident symbol in the hand of the infant Jesus, along with the tridents coming out of the statue's head. You'll see three tridents, two coming off the sides of the head and one coming off the top of the head. This is not baby Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pagan sun god, Tammuz, from the story of Baal, Nimrod, and Semiramis ended up being Cupid in today's Valentine's Day. And right here is the ancient Babylonian altar for the sun god Baal, and its main symbol is the eight-pointed star, which can be depicted as two four-point stars built inside of one another as the solar wheel. We see the same solar wheel sunburst over a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Here is a monastery uh, St. Ignatius, where the solar wheel or sunburst is depicted in the floor tiles. Here is the face of a child, which is of course Tammuz, within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. The same exact symbol is shown uh, in a face of the Babylonian sun god on a pulpit in a Roman Catholic church in Scandinavia. Okay, all this same symbol comes right out of paganism as I've shown. Okay, this is probably one of the most fascinating pictures that I have. Uh, I zoomed in to the Vatican using Google Earth and stopped several miles above. And, and look what we discovered is this is the largest solar wheel on Earth. This is the court of St. Peter at the Vatican in Rome itself. Excuse me, the sun disk behind the head of this Roman Catholic statue in Westminster Ca uh, Cathedral in London. Where did they get the idea of sun disks behind these saints? Uh, it's because this was what was found on J behind the head of Jupiter and all these sun gods uh, was the actual uh, monstrance of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. That, that halo is not a halo, that is a sun disk, and they borrowed it from paganism. We see here behind Krishna another sun disk behind his head, and this is just to show that it doesn't just happen in Catholicism, that the sun disk predates Catholicism by hundreds, even thousands of years. It was borrowed. We see it in stained glass windows behind all of the Roman Catholic saints, even Mary. And if you look carefully, you see the sacred heart, that sacred heart, even though I don't have time to go into this, even the sacred heart comes right out of paganism. That exact same symbol with the sun disk behind the sacred heart has to do with Baal and Tammuz, the sun gods. And you can see it all over the Roman Catholic Church, and even in other pagan religions across the world. And where do we find this eight-pointed star, this solar wheel, this sun disk today? None other than on top of our Christmas trees. Now, I know all of us have been taught that the star on top of the Christmas tree represents the star of Bethlehem that the kings came in to find baby Jesus. But unfortunately, the star of the ancient pagan sun gods predates the star of the Christmas tree, the star of Bethlehem, by over a thousand years. They were taking the sunburst and connecting it to what you're going to learn in just a few minutes is the tree of Nimrod, and that is where we get our Christmas tree from and the star that we put on top. If you look carefully, you can see there is a tremendous significance and a similarity between the sunburst and the star that we put up there today. Here's the sun disk proudly displayed on top of Christmas trees in, in a mall. Matter of fact, this one doesn't even hide the fact that it's not a star. It's the sun that you're looking at. Even the eight-pointed star on top of the White House Christmas tree for everyone to see is the same eight-point star that you, we find in archaeology thousands of years ago connected to pagan sun god worship. This is an incredible quote that I found in my research when trying to make a connection between Ishtar and the eight-pointed star. And in Uruk, a ancient Sumerian city in southern Iraq, 3,000-year-old tablets were discovered where it said that the celestial identity of Ishtar was none other than the eight-pointed star. You can look up the resource for that on your own. Okay, the word obelisk literally means Baal's shaft or Baal's organ of reproduction. It's almost always placed in the center of a circle, the solar wheel, which represents the female genitalia and the physical sexual act. And so this is why the solar wheel and the obelisk work together in tandem. This is why you see the solar wheel in the Vatican Square. St. Peter's Square, and you see the obelisk that runs right dead center through the hub of that wheel. It's the consummation of that sexual act between the sun god and his wife, Semiramis, or Ishtar, or as we pronounce it in English, 
Easter. You can see how the two work in tandem together. Now, in some of these, as the one that you can see here in Turkey, you can see that the ancient hieroglyphic and their language and pictures are actually still on these obelisks. Here's Cleopatra's needle. A Cleopatra's needle is not uh, just, uh, just a, a neat little emblem. This is a, was erected as a commemoration to the sun god there in London. This is the oldest obelisk in Scotland. This is the oldest obelisk in Switzerland, you can see. In Germany, in Paris, France, this one's covered with Egyptian hieroglyphics all talking about a sun god worship. How about Mecca? It would scare me to death, ladies and gentlemen, to find out that, in, that Islam's, uh, one of their big uh, idols is an obelisk right there, dead center, downtown Mecca. And here, these obelisks we find all over the United States here. How about in Luxor, Egypt, near the Nile River, there is an Egyptian obelisk. This is one of the most famous obelisks in the entire world. It's in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's dedicated to the sun god Ra, who is said to live inside of it. Everyone in that town, in that city, it's been there and knows the history behind uh, that obelisk, knows that and understands that. Here's one in Amsterdam. Here's one in Ethiopia. Mongolia. That is not a place uh, for an Egyptian uh, obelisk, which represents the male organ of the sun god coming through the genitalia of the solar wheel should not be in anything that is connected to Jesus, our Lord, whatsoever. But unfortunately it is in this modern day. The mixture of paganism and Christianity has crept into such a degree that we don't even recognize it because we don't know our history. We don't read the front of the book. Okay, now this is an interesting slide because this particular picture is of a obelisk that's in the court of St. John's Church over there in Rome. And it's actually the Pope's church. It's actually the cathedral of the Pope. Here, here's this obelisk, where it came from. The Egyptian, Egyptian obelisk that stands in the square of St. John Lateran is the largest in existence. Originally carved during the reign of Pharaoh Thutmose III, it stood in the temple of Amman in Thebes, Sun Ga, but was removed to Rome by Emperor Constantinus, AD 317 to 361, and placed in the Circus Maximus. In 1587, Pope Sixtus V unearthed the fallen, broken, and long-forgotten obelisk and had it repaired and placed in the Piazza S. Giovanni in Laterano. How about the Washington Monument? Is it a monument? It certainly is a monument, but it's not a monument uh, to our God. It's a monument to the sun God. Where do we find this main symbol of the obelisk? Would it shock you to discover that we find it in our churches? That's right. That's where the, the, the sun god obelisk ended up. It ends up in our churches all around the world. We call them steeples. They're called obelisk in ancient Egypt. If Pharaoh or an ancient Egyptian was alive today, you would, they would walk down the street and they would feel comfortable coming to most of the churches that we have today because they would say, wow, that is my religion. That's something that I can connect to. That is sun god worship. And we see throughout all around the world, here's one that has two uh, pillars that are built into this particular church. Ladies and gentlemen, the obelisk, the sun god uh, worship, there shouldn't be one single symbol anywhere of ancient paganism or Egyptian uh, sun god worship that is found inside of our religious societies today in Christianity. We see it, it doesn't matter what denomination, whether it's Lutheran, whether it's Baptist, whether it's non-denominational, it doesn't matter where you find it, no matter what denomination, you are going to find this obelisk all over the place. Now we come to this same slide that says, but that's not what it means to me, Jim. And I know that many of you are thinking that. And the reality is, is it doesn't matter what it means to us. And that's so difficult for us to comprehend and to get through our hearts and our minds that it only matters what it means to him. Certainly most of us would not wear a necklace that was a satanic symbol. But yet we will, we will build churches with symbols that we don't even know are satanic. 
Uh, we will have holidays that, su that surround themselves with pagan symbols, and yet because we don't know them, we think it's okay. But the reality is, is that the great God of Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he knows what those symbols mean. And so from his perspective, he sees those symbols, and it reminds him of when they passed their children through the fire of Molech. It reminds them of the infants that were, that were killed and sacrificed on the altars of Ishtar. It reminds him of all the sun god worship, of all of his, his people that turned their side against Yahweh and served other gods. It's a reminding symbol to him, and for that reason alone, we should put those symbols behind us and get rid of them, burn them like Nehemiah and, uh, and all of the, and Jeremiah and, and the great prophets of old that tore down those high places and they destroyed those pillars. And here they spent their blood uh, in pouring, pouring out their blood and their strength and their children to tear down those high places. And here we are building those high places right back up. Now, when do you think the birthday of Nimrod and Tammuz was? On the first day of the year when the sun is reborn. And what day do you think that the sun is reborn? In the middle of the winter, at the winter solstice, December 25th. That's right. That's where we get December 25th on Christmas Day where we say that Jesus was born. Why did we choose Jesus being born on December 25th? Where did that date come from? Very simple. Jesus was the Son of God. Tammuz was the son of the gods. He was the son of his father, Baal. And so the pagans, which early Christianity came right out of paganism in Rome, they were already worshiping the sun god on Sunday in Rome, which is where we get worshiping on Sunday from. It used to be that all of the early Christians worshiped on Saturday, but it was changed to Sunday because all of the pagans worshiped the sun god on his day, Sunday, and they worshipped him on his birthday on December 25th. So naturally, when Jesus came into the picture and uh, Constantine supposedly got saved in the 300s, they compromised to make it easier for people to convert to Christianity by making Jesus' birthday on the same birthday as, as the sun gods that they were already used to celebrating. And that's where we get December 25th from. Let's move to this character called Odin because this is where we're going to get into a little bit more detail of, of our holiday is where some of these symbols come from. Along with the celebration of the sun gods, the Scandinavians also worshipped this god called Odin. He was the god of intoxicating drink, ecstasy, as well as the god of death. And because of the Feast of Saturnalia dealing with all those things, he naturally became uh, the most popular god of the Feast of Saturnalia, uh, which was a sun god which we can trace all the way back to Baal himself. Guess who this character became. Look at him very carefully. What does he look like? The colors are wrong, but this guy became Santa Claus. That's right. Odin, or Woden, was the god of wisdom, magic, and occult knowledge, runes, poetry, and war. And so what we're going to show you right now is an actual clip or a short movie of a montage of different videos that we've discovered of where they still make this celebration, still celebrate this all around the world where they, they literally glorify the demonic part uh, of Christmas and St. Nicholas and these dark helpers. There are some scholars that believe that the actual song Jingle Bells came from the Krampus Bells that, that were in existence for a long time before that song was ever written. That every time you saw St. Nicholas, he was accompanied by the bells of Christmas, if you will, from his elves. They used to, to have bells that would hang from their necks. And as you heard in the video, they would, uh, you, you would hear the bells as, as they announced themselves into the next town that they were going into. Look here, the World Book Encyclopedia says this, the belief that Santa enters the house through the chimney 
developed from an old Norse legend. The Norse believed that the goddess Hertha appeared in the fireplace and brought good luck to the home. Let's move into Deuteronomy chapter 12. This is really uh, the, the king of scriptures, if you will, that give us a good, clear indication of whether or not we can do things just because we are sincere about it. Deuteronomy chapter 12 says this, And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, their obelisk, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. He says, you shall not at all do, as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever's right in our own eyes. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, still in chapter 12 of Deuteronomy here, and you displace them and dwell in their land, listen carefully, in verse 30 it says, Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will also do likewise. So what was happening was they were coming into these communities, and they were creative Israelites. They wanted to take some of the, the creative things that the pagans used to serve their gods and borrow those, those ideas to serve the great God Yahweh. And, uh, and Yahweh has this to say about it. He says in verse 31, You shall not worship Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add or take away from it. Period. Verse 32 of Deuteronomy chapter 12. And some of the most influential Christian leaders in American history were looking for alternatives and refused to celebrate Christmas and Easter because of their pagan backgrounds. Charles Spurgeon said this, On December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1871, look at this quote, We have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. First, because we do not believe in the Mass at all, but abhor it, whether it be said or sung in Latin or English. He went on to say, and secondly, because we find no scriptural warrant whatsoever for observing any day as the birthday of our Savior. And consequently, its observance is a superstition because it's not of divine authority. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most spiritually held up uh, pastors of, of all time, is Charles Spurgeon. And he himself says Christmas is of no divine origin, it's of no divine authority, and we absolutely should not celebrate it. Why? Because he knew that its origins were in paganism and cultic philosophy. I want to share with you some alternatives, uh, biblical alternatives, something that's straight from God himself, things that he tells us to celebrate, curriculums designed for our children. Look at some of these holidays. First of all, we have uh, what did all of the disciples do in the spring that just so happens to be the time of Easter? Absolutely, it's called Passover. Luke twenty-two nineteen 19 says this, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do Passover. Obviously, Easter was nowhere in the minds of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, or his disciples, or anybody for hundreds of years. They celebrated what's in Hebrew called Pesach, Passover, every single year, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of their Lord through that incredible holiday where they used to sacrifice a Passover lamb for the remembrance of the death of the firstborn and, uh, and the freedom from Egypt. But now today they were remembering the freedom from sin, freedom from Egypt being metaphorical by the death of Jesus himself. So they would never have connected Easter with Passover. It didn't exist. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul even instructs us in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the festival, talking about Passover, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Friends, whenever they enforce their son, worship 
day sunday worship whenever the law it's in force in your country do not accept it the mark of the beast in their forehead symbolic in revelation your forehead means your decision and also when revelation says they are right hand means your action will follow your decision once you accept they are son worship day when it's an enforced sunday worship and uh, if you do visit one of the local churches make sure to visit a local church that has these two charts hanging up in there uh, because if it's not hanging up in there you may want to be careful if you visit every seventy adventist and if you don't see this two chart about two tables don't go if you don't see these tables hanging our churches better be careful what you're going to hear because you're not going to hear the foundation of adventists the reason why all this foolish wind of doctrines or false doctrine that is brewing Adventism right now because a lot of people, they offshoot. They're not on the foundation of Adventists.